been making noodles for a long time and you know when I think when I went to college I bought one of those Atlas cranks which are really they're fun you know and easy to use and um, kind of got into making pasta but never on a large scale or never never thought about really writing about it and this past summer I was in uh, at Boston University they put me up in a dorm and I get there and there's this full beautiful kitchen in the dorm room um, and not a single pot or pan or utensil or anything and I thought I'm not gonna spend a few weeks here and not cook it's just not gonna happen so I went down to the um, there was like a Asian grocery right down the street and I saw you know really cheap little pot and I saw you know I bought a set of chopsticks and I just bought whatever I could for a few dollars and I saw ramen noodles there and I have to admit I've never eaten ramen noodles before it just never never occurred to me for whatever reason and I thought this will be easy and fun and I, you know, I bought some vegetables to throw in and stuff like that this is for breakfast okay and it was like a sudden revelation like all of a sudden uh, what have I been missing my whole life is these uh, these wonderful noodles for breakfast and it kind of got me um, I, when I sort of pick a topic I go maniacal on it so when since that happened since about September um, I've been doing another one every single day, so another noodle soup. And in fact, before I came here, I think I've gone about two weeks without eating anything but noodle soup. <laughs> I mean, so, so it's a little, you know, it's crazy. But this is, this, it'll make its way into a book. And there were there are different techniques that I'd never tried, and different um, bases that that work in noodles. So I'll talk about a couple of those in the pictures that I show you, which are just basically what I've been cooking for the past um, few months. I'm almost done, I think, with the research. I haven't written anything yet, but it's, the research is fine. But what I'm going to show you now is the simplest noodle of all. Absolutely, utterly simple, fresh, something that costs practically nothing. I mean, this much flour probably costs less than a dollar. Um, a few tomatoes, a few eggs. There's really nothing in this if, to have around. Um, and it's really impressive. <laughs> that's, that's the point. And you don't need any equipment or fancy machines or anything like that. All I'm going to use is a rolling pin. Um, and to start with, you know, the flour kind of makes a difference. If you use um, a flour that has too high of a protein content, it'll be really hard to roll out. So just ordinary all-purpose flour works fine. But if you wanted to add other things to it, you can use whole wheat, of course. You can use, you know, I saw back there all sorts of red, Bob's Red Mill, you know, Teff and various other things. They work great. Um, so I'm just adding a little salt to this. And, you, the, you know, the traditional way to do it is right on the board and you make a, a volcano and you plop the eggs in the top. I don't see any reason to do that. This is a lot neater. And I won't get flour all over the place. Well, I will get flour all over the place, but, but at least not quite as much. Um, and I'm literally just going to start with two. I need a third. There's uh, three cups of flour in here. That's a, that's a lot. Usually I would do much less uh, for me. But I'm going to just work this in pretty easily. And... Um, that's really all there is. I'll add some water. You can just use water, in fact, if you don't want to use eggs. This makes a nicer, a little richer of a noodle. Um, and there's really not much more to it. Um, people will tell you, oh, you need this proportion and that, that sort of measurement. I find it's really just easier to feel the dough, you know, and that's true about cooking in general, I think. If you kind of wing it, um, you'll eventually know how it feels. True of bread too, and this is actually much, much easier than bread. You don't have to let it rise. You don't really have to do anything with it. Um, let me show you some of the things that I've been doing. Let's start with the first one. And I'll just, while I'm doing boring stuff, I'll show you what I've been making. I think the first one is agnolotti, um, which is the exact same dough as this. It's just a, a wheat flour dough. And you can stuff, they're just cut out in little circles. You can see I've got a, I think a crimped edge on it, but it's just a circle. You put a plop of, blob of something in there and fold it over and there's really nothing more to it. These I think have squash in there. So if you use like a um, butternut or a kabocha squash is really nice. Cooked really down until it's very thick and then put in there and then um, add to that like a, a sauce that's made of butter and eggs and a little lemon. They're just so simple and lovely and um, much more interesting as squash. So the next one. So these are 
literally in alphabetical order. So there's no, no logic, rhyme, or reason to the order that I'm doing them. These are hand-cut noodles made out of um, something that, this was last week, two weeks ago, was the Chinese New Year. And normally I like to just go into the Asian supermarket and see whatever they have there. And they had this little bulb-like root. Looks sort of like a tulip bulb. And I thought, someone's eating this. I don't know what it's for or what it is. And I bought it before I knew exactly what to do with it. And sometimes that's fun. If you actually show the next one, you'll see what, what it looks like. It's just the, these little bulbs. And normally, if you have a, have a root vegetable like this, they, um, you can't just cook it and work it in. It's got too much, it absorbs too much water. So what I did was par peel these. It's sort of like a water chestnut in texture. And then parboiled it and then dehydrated it. I know this sounds ridiculous. And then, um, and then ground it in a little spice grinder. So I got maybe, you know, a cup of flour or so and um, nothing else. I didn't have to add anything else. It the one right before this is what, uh, what they looked like rolled out. Really interesting, very sweet kind of chestnutty flavor. So I don't know whether they do this in Asia or whether it's certainly, I don't think it's traditional. Um, I found out afterwards that they cut them into coin shapes and it's for good luck, you know, it's supposed to bring money or whatever. But, but that's the kind of just wild, you know, experiments that I've been doing lately. Actually, let's see the next one, what that is. This was something that I have tried to do for years and years with the same problem, is how do you get an artichoke into a pasta dough? Um, or if you just boil the artichoke and scrape them down and cut them up and you know mash them, there's so much water in there that in the end it doesn't taste like anything. You don't, you don't get any artichoke flavor. So again, playing with the um, dehydrator, I just sliced the artichokes raw and uh, you know took off the leaves and sliced the heart and then dehydrated that and ground it and added it to regular flour. And you can see, the, you know, I've added some little baby artichokes in there with it. And the broth is the artichokes from, you know, the water that I cooked the artichokes in. So this is like triple whammy. You know that effect that you, when you eat an artichoke, like all your taste buds open up and you have this wonderful apparent kind of effect. So this, this really, really worked well. Um, and not that hard. You know, dehydrator, the, the cheaper ones cost $100 or so. So it's, I thought it was a fun investment to, um, play with. Uh, let's see the next one. This is a, this is going to look really weird, but I keep liking to deconstruct things and make dishes that are not what you'd expect them to be, like taking something ordinary that you'd be familiar with and then messing with it. Um, and so this is just an ordinary chicken noodle soup. Um, but if you'll see, the chicken that I used was so rich with in collagen from the skin and stuff that it turned out to be an aspic. And so I just poured the aspic out, put these little egg noodles, they're like spezzola on top and the vegetables and so it's it's really like a salad a cold salad but the flavors are entirely soup you know and that's a little basil or something that i've chopped on top of it so that was a you know fun deacon's reconstruction i should say um okay next one i think these are uh baozi or baozi which are um a chinese noodle that you steam and i think Maybe they're not, maybe that's hagao. In any case, you can put shrimp inside of it, you can put chopped pork, scallions, ginger, um, soy sauce, and then they're steamed and they come out really nice. That's just, a, just to show you. And it's a slightly different dough also. Those are made with, um, with tapioca starch and rice flour. So that when you, so they have this sort of translucence to them and they're chewy in a way that, that wheat flour won't get. Um, what does that say? <laughs> I, don't I don't remember what it is. It's barley. Oh, it's barley. Okay, so the um, gra this I gra ground myself. So you can buy, you know, barley, and I think it was red barley, strangely enough, uh, which made it makes a nice chewy kind of whole wheat noodle, um, which was which was nice. So I'm gonna while I'm doing this, I'm gonna let this rest just for a minute and talk about a couple more noodles. But that's you know you don't want to overwork it. The the um, protein chains align up at this point and will be a little hard to work to roll out. But I think I'll get probably two batches out of that, which should be fine. Okay, so this is um, absolutely standard beef stew with ordinary German noodles. So they're, they're egg noodles that are wide and cut. They'll be very much like these. And I think what I did, there was something kind of strange about this. I think I cooked them in the broth itself. So, so you know, you get double the flavor rather than boiling them. And it's just parsnips and carrots and celery and really simple, but nice. Um, these are beet noodles, um, and beets are one of the really easy things to get a nice dramatic effect. And you can see I've made them as long as I possibly could just for, just because it was fun. Um, the, I think what's strange about these is that I just used beet juice. So I used a juicer, took out the beets, you know, which people do all the time now with juicers, 
and uh, use that instead of water. So I got a really nice pink color and it, uh, they're good. They taste like beets. You know, they, they lose a little bit of color when you cook them, but, but it's fun to try and slurp this whole thing in one go. It's just, you know, you get the whole nine yards. Okay, one more, I think. Um, well, this, I, this takes a little bit of explanation. It's a very strange combination. There's a dish, which we actually spoke about today, uh, called a blamanche. Uh, it's medieval, basically chicken uh, pounded with um, rose water and sugar and almond milk. And I know that sounds really gross, uh, but it's sweet and chickeny, and they loved it in the Middle Ages. And I thought, let me try and reconstruct this in a way that's noodle soup. So those are actually rice noodles. They're in almond milk. And actually, if you make almond milk, it's, um, it's so much nicer than the stuff you buy in the store, which is flavored with almonds and got chemicals and stuff in it, and it's sweet. Um, this really tastes exactly like milk. I mean, it's, all you do is you take raw almonds, you blanch them, pull off the outer, um, you know, the brown coating, pound them up or actually put them in the blender, it's much easier, and then pour hot water over it and then strain that and you have this stuff that's really very much like milk. And the logic of it in the Middle Ages was that during Lent you couldn't use dairy products, so you, this would be a substitute for that. But it's beautiful on its own. And these, um, you know, I just kind of wanted, it's got flour, um, it's got rose water in it and a little bit of sugar, and I just put some orange zest on it to give it a little little extra oomph. So, so these are not, you know, historical recipes at all. They're just my um, interpretations, you know, things that would be fun to make and easy. So um, I'm gonna just start rolling this out. I'm gonna see what I'm doing. There's nothing really to it. Um, I want to get it as thin as possible, but actually it doesn't matter, <laughs> really, you know. Some people like wide noodles, some people like thin ones, it doesn't, it's not going to matter one way or the other. But I'll probably have to cut this in two. Um, there are a lot of ways to do this also. You can cut it with a knife, like I'm doing. You can roll it around, roll it up and cut it with a scissor, which works fine. Um, you can pass it through this thing, which I really love. It's called a, a kitara, which is exactly like the word. It sounds like a guitar. It's a box that has strings across it, and you press the dough on top and roll it, and it just comes out perfectly cut from the strings. And, and you can actually play it, too, which is really fun. It's a, it's a fun instrument. <clears throat> um, so I'm just going to roll this out. So let's see one more noodle while I'm doing this. Okay, so this is a little weird. Um, actually, show the next one and you'll see why this is weird. That, does anyone know what that is? It's blood. It's just pig blood. It coagulates like that. Um, for a long time it was illegal and I found it once, again, Asian grocery store, and I've been dreaming about cooking with blood for a long time and thought I'm never gonna do this in this country. And about a couple of years ago I saw this big bucket of blood and I thought, oh my God, I have to buy this. And so it was about five bucks for like something this size. <laughs> and I thought, uh-oh, it's gonna like spill in the car and I'm gonna get stopped <laughs> by the police and they're gonna say, yeah, that's pig blood, okay. <laughs> so, and it's weird. Um, this goes into soup like this, but I thought, let me just see what happens if I make a noodle out of it. And what I did was just mix the blood in with the flour. So it has a flavor that's sort of like, you know, a boudin noir, that sort of thing, uh, cooked in what looks like a chicken broth. And the other strange thing on top of this, just to give it a little perversity, is um, kimchi that's been dehydrated. So, I, you know, kimchi is really easy to make. You just um, basically cut up um, Napa cabbage, and I put carrots and chili peppers and other junk in there, and you just let it go. You know, close the lid and let it bubble, and in a couple of weeks it gets sour and fermented and lovely, and then and really garlicky, which is which is nice. But it's uh, I just thought, look, what would happen if I dehydrated this? And so that's that. And I just just plopped it on top of the soup, which is rather nice. How about one more, and then we'll. Okay, can anyone tell what that is? I want information from the audience. If you can pull it apart, those are sprinkles. <laughs> Dessert pasta. Made of what? White chocolate. That would be a good guess. No, it's not. <laughs> Come on, what would be really easy to work with and taste good and contrast? The sauce is chocolate. You know, it's a sort of chocolate soup made out of Mexican drinking chocolate. It's um, it's marzipan. Oh, so you can roll it out, cut it into noodles, and they kept their shape and they look beautiful. And so it's just a um, candy soup, <laughs> totally. <laughs> 
um, really nice, uh, I think I put um, candied angelica on there and I put peppermint candy and other stuff, but it was really nice and I didn't share that one. <laughs> I just told myself. Okay, one more. Um, I think that's chestnut flour. Uh, chestnuts, you, in um, Italy they sell, um, they use it in something called a castagnaccio, which is a kind of cake made with chestnut flour, which is dense and really sweet and lovely. Um, and I thought, well, see what happens if noodles, and there is a noodle like this in the north, it's called pizzocchieri, which is um, usually got mm -hmm. melted cheese on it. It's, oh, it's really fabulous. But I thought the effect would kind of be like a, um, like a uh, soba, you know, sort of nutty um, buckwheat sort of noodle. But I'm pretty sure that's chestnut, which came out nice. Another one. This is the weirdest thing I've ever made. <laughs> I know it's going to sound really strange. Um, no, I don't think anyone could guess what it is. It's really not, the ingredients aren't so strange. The noodles are made of chia, which has gotten really popular in health food stores lately. I don't know why. It has no flavor, but it gels in a really weird way. So it made an interesting noodle texture-wise, and I thought maybe it would be fun in a cold noodle, so it's a cold soup. So that's just blackberries cooked down um, like a summer soup, which apparently they do this in um, Poland. It's called Ova, Ova Kova or something like that, which is um, a cold fruit soup based with noodles in it, which is... Is this like a cocktail or...? Yeah, I actually put alcohol in there too, rum, <laughs> just, for, just for the hell of it and see what happened. And I think that's a whole branch of, uh, you know, noodles that no one thinks about. You know, go to a bar and have your noodle <laughs> in your, have your snacks in your drink already. So you can see this takes a little bit of muscle power, but not a whole lot. That's a, probably a power of mine. Okay, looks beautiful. I'm just gonna... I'll probably cut this in half. And you know, so if you were to cut this really carefully, which I could, actually there's no reason not to, um, you'd get either tagliatelle or you'd get a, um, I mean, you could do any, any shape really, wide noodles, you could do lasagna out of this. If you cut it really badly, you get mal tagliati, which is just, but I'm gonna try and just cut these nicely as I can. No reason to be overzealous with it because they're all going to a pot anyway. I actually bought recently, I think it's, you'll see a picture of it, this knife that is ideally designed to do this. This is not, because it's got a curved blade, so you actually have to hack at it a, a bit, and sometimes it doesn't come through, but um, you'll see the one that I bought from Japan, which was really, really neat. And you know, if you had an Atlas crank, this is even quicker. I wouldn't go the route of a machine because they tend to, um, I mean, it takes the fun out, right? <laughs> build up a little sweat. They do have things that you can attach to your um, Cuisinart and, you know, that just seems to take all the fun out. Just make it nice. They're just a little bit too long for me to get in one swipe. If it gets a ukulele or a mandolin, it would work just as well as a guitar. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Now you'd only get six wide noodles there. <laughs> Maybe a harp would be better. Celtic harp or something like that. Okay, why don't you show the next image while I'm cutting these up. And I'll explain what's going on there. Hmm, okay, so this is a really weird one. And I think if you know are familiar with the original dish, the flavors will make sense as I put them together. Um, it's chickpea flour, which you can buy in an Indian grocery store called Besan, or you can buy just um, what they use in Italy to make farinata or to make um, uh, panisse, you know, if you go to uh, Marseille or not Marseille, uh, Arles or one of those, you know, south of France, they make these lovely things out of chickpea flour. And what I did was made noodles out of them. And then I thought I want the flavor of a um, falafel. So it's a tahini sauce base with tomatoes and the, the flavor is kind of similar, you know, to um, you know, nothing's fried in there, but the, they came together kind of nicely. Next one. 
Um, I don't know what those are. What does it say? That's the chickpea. Oh, that's the chickpea flour mm -hmm. noodles, right, that I just put in that thing. Okay, so why don't I make these? What am I doing on time? I'll put these over there. Let me just flour them up a bit and get started on a sauce. So this, this is certainly enough for two people, maybe a little more, you know, depending on dinner or something like that. Should I roll with the other one? Yeah, might as well. Okay, so let me see the next one. Those are, I don't know, what does it say? Those chitara. <laughs> oh yeah, so that's what the noodles look like cut on that on that chitara, which are kitara, which is, um, they're really even and fine and, and slightly squared off, but but uh, really nice. Love, love the way those look. This is an extruded noodle. So I've been playing with extruders lately. Um, in general, I don't like the mechanical ones, which which kind of make a really soft, unpleasant dough. But I um, have contacted recently, um, actually, well, I'll tell you the whole story. It was I was in, um, ages ago, I had this little cookie press kind of thing that like, looks like a gun and it sort of has a plunger and it's for you know making pressed cookies. And I thought, and I took it down to the pottery studio. I have a pottery studio under the kitchen and um, started using it for clay, which of course I ruined it <laughs> and it's, you know, wouldn't use it for food. So I went down to the bakery supply store and said, let me see if I can find another one like this. And I think the next picture should be the, the gun itself. Yeah, there it is. So I bought this thing, it was not uh, inexpensive, it was about $100. <laughs> so I thought, you know what the hell, I'll just go in for it and see, see how this thing works for fun. And it, it's got polymer plastic dyes in the front of the thing. So it apparently, they say it has 900 pounds of pressure in it, which I don't know whether, whether that's true or not, but it, it works actually really nicely. You just put the dough in there and squeeze it and it comes out. Uh, the thing is that the dyes were really thick. So, so I got this noodle that was just a little too thick to deal with, you know, to chew happily. So I called up the, the place and said, you know, can you cut me some other dyes, you know, and, you know, make smaller holes or do whatever. Because I've seen, you know, brass dyes for pasta making that are really interesting looking and shape wise. And the guy said, well, um, why don't you send me some drawings, show me exactly what you want. Um, and we can, and, and long conversation ensued from this whole thing. And he said, we should partner because no one, the, the thing is made for clay or for pastry uh, decoration. No one had ever thought of it to use it for pasta. And I said, okay, I'll design a handful of dyes for you. You cut them and I'll test them out. And <laughs> so I'm in business, I guess, which I never really expected to happen. Um, and they're, they haven't sent me them yet, but you know, I drew basically ones to make shells, to make fusilli, to make um, something else and the guy drew them up and is gonna cut them with a laser and I think it's very exciting, you know, just to see what happens. Um, I don't know whether it'll be economical for people to spend a hundred bucks, but um, you know, maybe if they sell it with, I'm hoping they'll sell it with the book, <laughs> you know? And, um, okay, so let's see the next one. Um, this is, I don't even know what this is. It's not a terribly exciting soup, but, but I wanna sort of show you that part of what I'm doing is thinking synergistically about the shape of the bowls that the food is served in and the um, and the contents itself. Because sometimes things just don't, like this is not a shape you'd want to eat a dumpling from. You'd want a dumpling to have a slightly rounder thing so you could put your chopsticks in and lift it out. And this is um, for longer noodles where you want, it's sort of like a wine glass shape. You know, some you want an open stem so you can breathe in the aroma and some you want a closed stem like champagne so it is focused and concentrated. So the idea of this, it's, it's actually fire clay. So it's a, it's a clay that can go right on the stovetop and you see it right there. And I have found that um, also some types of bowls just don't retain heat very well. So if you wanna, like, you know, if this is gonna take 10, 15 minutes to eat, it'll be cold by the time you're done. So the idea was to have something that could go right from the stovetop to the, um, to the table. And unfortunately the clay itself costs a fortune. So it's like $50 a bag, so if I get, three or four bowls out of it, that's really bad, <laughs> you know, in terms of, um, you know, the price of the things, but um, but it worked. So I was happy about that. And um, it's it's kind of strange because the guy who made the formula for this is in Sacramento, but he can't sell it to me from there. <laughs> that's why I usually buy clay. He only sells through this place in Berkeley. So I have to drive an hour and a half to find it, which is pain in the neck. But, you know, I'm thinking of um, bowl shapes along with the, um, with the soups itself. Okay, so I've gotten... So did you make this bag? Yes, I did. Also, almost all the stuff that you see here that's 
pottery I made to go with the individual soups. Not all of them are new, but some of them are recent. Okay, next one. This one I did not make. In fact, I just bought these in Sonoma. <laughs> they're, it's plastic. It's melamine, which I just think they're beautiful. But they do not keep anything warm for any time at all. Um, so this one, I think I'm going to do these a little shorter. Just so I can move quicker on this. Um, the soup itself, okay, I guess I need you to try and guess what this is. Really fun experiment. Think deconstruction. Okay, I'll give you a hint. The um, noodles are made out of a potato. So what you do is you, you grate the potato, squeeze it, and the starch that comes from the bottom, um, you pour off the water and then you add, I think I added a little wheat flour to that to keep it together, but it's basically a potato starch noodle. And what context would you find that in reconstructed? It's, it's a hard one. It's, um, it's in a soup made of ketchup. So that's French fries and ketchup. That's a, that's a noodle soup. Um, and it tasted exactly like it, you know, and you could just imagine them not crispy, but okay. So these should be lovely. Okay. So let's start the sauce. So, you know, grandma says you have to cook the sauce for hours and hours and everything. So this is going to defy all logic. Um, I'm going to cook this as quickly as possible on as high heat as possible. And I'm not going to take any of the, I'm just going to throw everything in and see what happens and then use the food mill to make it smooth. Um, so let me get this cranked up. The front is, there you go. Okay. And, it, and it, you know, especially when you have really good fresh tomatoes, the um, flavor comes through and you don't really end up overcooking it. I think gives it a, I don't know, the flavor just, you lose something from the freshness of tomatoes. See, I'm not stemming, I'm not doing anything. Normally I'd put in some herbs from the garden or, um, you know, onions with the peels. I'm not even gonna bother peeling this. I'm just gonna, gonna stuff some of those in there. They'll all come through afterwards. Okay, let's go to the next noodle so I can talk while I'm doing this. Yeah, I'm not even peeling these. You don't need to. It's all going to go through the food mill. That's way okay, next one. Oh, well, that's not good. Mm. Okay, so that is a rice and tapioca noodle, which is really lovely, chewy. They, they get a little translucent also. Um, and I don't think I've put it in the soup yet, but those I really like. They're, um, when you see um, rice, actually the technique on this is really bizarre. So if you try and make a roll out of rice noodle, you end up putting in far too much flour, um, you know, starch, and they just come out gummy and really nasty. So the technique here, is that you put it, put a cloth or a, um, a tray, you pour a batter of this stuff and you put it in a steamer and the whole thing steams, then you pull it off and slice it up. And so, so you've seen these uh, probably in a, an Asian grocery store when they sell rice noodles, they're in a, in a sort of skein and they're folded up. That's what it is. And I just cut those up to make, um, this is what they put in a Thai soup, things like that. It's really much, much easier. No rolling, no anything. So that's, that's what I put it in, just this glass tray. And that's the actual, um, batter after it's been um, steamed it has this weird translucence to it um, and tapioca you might know is one of the largest crops in the whole world it's um, the little uh, boba that they have in bubble tea if you've ever had that and it's um, we just don't use it very much but it's tapioca starch is nice okay so next one okay this is just last week it's, it's a deconstruction that is as perverse as it possibly can get I have to admit is this on? Yeah. Okay. Is 
think, if you can look closely, you see that there's layers in this. <coughs> you tell that there's a patty, a hamburger patty in the middle. And so I took noodles, pressed them into the bottom and the top of the whole thing, just submerged it in broth. So, the, so it's not a broiled hamburger. It's actually the noodles and the hamburger cooked together in the broth. And then crumbled on blue cheese, some let that's lettuce cooked in there, it's and ketchup. And it's exactly all the ingredients you'd find in a in a hamburger. And it's, it's really good. So sick, but good. Um, okay, next one. So I've been playing with the idea of uh, making ramen, instant ramen myself. And um, you might know that the guy who invented ramen noodles, it's only about a century ago, but this, his birthday was this week, 105th birthday. It's not, he just died recently, but... Um, and the process to make instant noodles, they actually fry the noodles. So they take, take a very thin noodle and they're fried, and then, which is why you can actually eat them right out of the package. I didn't know that until recently. It's gross, but you can eat them. Um, so I thought, what would happen if I made the noodles and then dehydrated them? So this is the sort of tray that the, goes into the dehydrator. And then I just kept going from there and thought I could add, make a dried dehydrated vegetables. I could take a really good homemade stock and dehydrate that. So I think the next one should be all of those things. Yes, it is put together. So th those are the noodles after dehydration. That's some ham cut up. That um, that's some zucchini and vegetables and whatever. And that's the stock just came out as these thin sheets. And I just broke it all up, put it in a jar, and it made perfectly good soup. I wasn't sure if all the things would, would you know cook together at the same time, but it's like you know if you're cooking in the morning breakfast, this is actually really easy. You just th sort of throw it in the thing and. Don't have to worry about defrosting anything or whatever. Is there a way I could put this up higher? I don't know, it's, it seems to be on high, but I'm not really kicking it. Okay, let's give it a few minutes then. All right, let's go. Hmm, this is another weird deconstruction. Um, it is peppers, you can see, yellow peppers. It's a clear broth, I think made of shellfish, if I'm not mistaken, and what's in the center is a lasagna that I cut out with a cookie round and just plopped right into the soup. Um, it sounds really bizarre, but it's nice. You know, kind of the, the way the tomato sauce and the cheese melts into the soup. It's, I, it was a really good one. Okay, next one, I think. Um, this is killer. This is actually my favorite, I think. Um, that's a lobster tail, um, shrimp, all the shells I used to make the stock. I made a really fine um, rice and wheat noodle to go with it with cilantro on top. And there's a couple of sort of crutches that I use every uh, often in the morning is sriracha is the most wonderful thing. I never really liked it in the past, but now I'm just addicted to it. And lime juice and uh, fresh cilantro, those will make a, the most boring soup sing. And this one is just luxuriant. Um, love that one. This is a really bizarre technique. And I will show you actually how to do, why I used all the, the dough, but it's um, if you take a pair of pinking shears and you cut the noodle, uh, actually, even regular scissors. If you just take, take make a long thing and cut it with a, with a scissor, it curls around and makes a shell. And I'll show you what, what those look like in just a moment. But this is a technique that I know from clay, which is called neriage, which is a layer of black noodles made with squid ink and a layer of white noodles. And then you roll it up and then I cut it. So you get this weird spiral-like thing. It's just, it's bizarre, I know. Um, but uh, works works nicely as a shell. Uh, and these were the little ends that I also cut and threw, and it, they look like sea monsters or some, some kind of black shrimp. I don't know. Those are actually noodles in there uh, swimming around. And the next one is, I know, even more strange, but this is a noodle, believe it or not. It's rolled out just the way I did these. It is the, uh, the same Nariage technique, but made with um, a beet noodle and a broccoli rabe. And they're just they're so cool. All right, so, burn these. I want a real sear on them. I don't want to put in too many, but that's good. Okay. Oregano. Bay leaves. I'm gonna get this. I know it goes into action in a minute. Let me get this back up. You can see there's two different finenesses of noodle here. It's not going to make a big deal. The difference. These are a little too thick, but do you smell that already? Mm -hmm. so, oh, I want to char. See how it's getting a nice char on it? And that's the
So boiled water, um, the water here smells like sulfur, but apart from that, it's um, just salt it really well. That's one thing I find that people don't do, is that it, um, you want it to be like seawater, you know, salty. It just tastes better that way. And that goes up, I will let that happen. Oh, fine. So like, you know, if you're on a, a board night and you have uh, some good tomatoes around, Something like this for breakfast with a couple of eggs dropped in, like a shashuka, is um, magnificent. So I'm just going to give that a few minutes. All right, next noodle. Let's see what they look like. Um, this is a pho stock. So, um, you know, to make Vietnamese soup, you basically have chilies and star anise and lime leaves and onions that have been roasted and lots of vegetables and beef uh, tendons and shanks and everything and it just boils. Uh, the way I usually do this is I'll brown all the ingredients in the oven for a couple of hours, then pour it into a stock pot, cover it with water and just leave it in the oven for about 12 hours overnight and just forget about it. And it doesn't boil over and it just very, very gently heats so you don't get a really cloudy stock and you don't have to worry about fining it or anything later. Um, it comes out just beautiful color. You can even see right there. You can see right through the stock. And I think those are... Um, I think I just added some more to make it look cool um, in the photo. Next one. Um, this is, you know, you can tell I'm sort of getting into the photography of it too. Now this is backlit, which I thought was fun, but it's a, um, there's a couple of techniques that involve cutting the noodle. And if you've probably seen this in a Chinese um, restaurant is they'll have a big block like this and a knife and you just slice down like this and cut. It's really hard to do well. Um, and I thought, this is just too hard. You know, they came out too thick or gummy or whatever. I'm, I'm getting there, but not, not quite there yet. So I thought, what would happen if I took one of my regular piping bags, made a slightly runnier noodle, flattened out the tip really thin, and then just squeezed the noodle into the broth, and they are beautiful, just really nice and chewy. And um, it's a, a rice and tapioca noodle, I think. Um, and these, this is actually the quickest and easiest noodle I've ever made. It was just like, you know, mix a batter, put it in the bag, and done, you know, in like 30 seconds. Really, really easy. Um, I guess that's what the whole bowl looks like. They're, they're, they're misshapen and ugly, but you know, but they're, they're really nice. Um, these are beautiful. <laughs> this is the stuff um, from the Philippines. It's called ume. It's a purple yam uh, and they sell it in a powdered form. It's just, just uh, it's not a sweet potato. It's actually a yam yam. And they sell it in a little powdered form and I just bought one and mixed it up and it works beautifully. Um, I think the next one is how I did it. No, I don't, it's not. This is my son's 18th birthday. He said, Dad, I want you to cook. He, I think he brought 14 friends over. I want you to cook the most elaborate meal you can as my birthday present. I was like, okay, sure, fun. And I had my neighbors actually serve them and it was formal dinner. So these are um, ravioli that I made. And I've, I have this around Thanksgiving. You can see this is right around Thanksgiving. I got into a kick of making things in tiny little portions. So this is one little bowl with one little noodle in it and a spoon, and they were they were nice. I think there's um, I think it's shrimp in there, something like that, which is fun. Okay, so let me see if this is boiling yet. <clears throat> Not almost there. Um, so this one, it looks like worms. I know, which is really unfortunate. But if you if you take one of these things, I'll use this in just a moment. This is a uh, food mill, right? You put the batter in there and just strain it through. You get these weird strings. I think these, I may have actually used a ricer for these. You know, the ricer you use for potatoes. I squeezed it out of there. And so they're not very long, but they're, they're nice. That's an easy, fun way to make a noodle. Next one. Yeah, I don't think you're ever going to guess in a million years what this is, but look closely at the ingredients. Some guesses. What kind of meat does that look like? And what's the stuff next to it? And the noodles look really strangely brown, don't they? Huh? I said Carl should get this one. <laughs> okay, so imagine the noodles are made of rye. Rye, yeah. <laughs> what would naturally go with rye? Corn beef. It's sauerkraut there. Okay. It's corned beef. <laughs> it's uh, it's Thousand Island dressing on top. It's a Reuben <laughs> deconstructed as, as soup. It was really good. <laughs> it sounds crazy, but. So, um, 
this is my, my artsy fartsy pictures of noodles. Those are soba, buckwheat noodles. Um, and they, it, this, this is actually, it looks like it would be perfect for cutting noodles because noodles it's really long and thin. It's actually made for fish and uh, it's not exactly flat, so it doesn't quite work well, but I just like the picture a lot, so I used it. Um, these are made of mung bean flour, completely translucent. I think they're the most beautiful noodle I've ever seen. They're just, um, and the funny thing is this happened, this was last week. Um, I was sitting down with my kids and uh, I said, I can't eat another noodle soup. This is crazy. You know, I've gone for like a week or two. And so let me just make a salad. It'll be fine. And put together all the ingredients for a salad. And I said, I can't bring myself to do it. And I dumped the salad into a bowl of water, into a pot of water, boiled it. Boiled salad is really good. I know that sounds crazy. Um, a drizzle of olive oil and mung bean noodles. It's salad soup. Um, it'll, it would be fantastic cold, actually. But this is hot. So what I'm going to do is cook this down with a little wine, or a lot of wine, whichever you like, and give it a stir. And I don't really want to cook this much, but you can see all the schmutz on the bottom, all this nice um, cooked little dark bits. That's exactly where all this flavor is going to come from. And it should be there almost quite. Okay, so let's see the next noodle. This is another extruded noodle, um, which is made out of gravlax. So if you take like a cured salmon, mix it with flour, and then squeeze it from a pastry bag with a star tip, and that's just chopped tomatoes, and I think I used a salmon broth out of the bones and stuff. Really nice, pleasant. That's the cut noodle made with a scissor. So if you ever want a really, really simple noodle, just chop it with a scissor, and you'll get this shape, which is, uh, and that's with the pinking shears. You know what pinking shears are, right? They're for, for uh, doing edges on hems and stuff. That gives you, that's as stunning a noodle as I've ever seen, and one of the easiest to make. So do they just roll up? When they you curl up like that, yeah. Let me. Okay, so I'm just gonna give this another minute to cook. And you can see they're, they're falling apart nicely. Probably will need salt. Crush up the garlic to get it in there. You know, and if you do this beginning to end, it's obviously not going to take you an hour. You know, this is this is. I'm doing a lengthy, leisurely version. Um, so that's the uh, little shells that I made just put into a broth with shrimp and really easy. Um, I think that must be broccoli rabe or something like that, which is my favorite vegetable. Goes beautifully in anything. Uh, next one. Oh God, this is so weird. This is the strangest noodle I've ever seen. Um, it looks like worms, I know. It's called shiritake and it's made from a noodle that has absolutely no calories whatsoever. Your body doesn't digest it, it goes right through. And so for diet, there are diet companies that use this stuff. And I thought, okay, let me try this, see what happens. And it, um, you feel full and then an hour later you're starving because you've got no, no, no calories at all. Um, I like it though, it's really weird and chewy and it doesn't, you can leave it in liquid and cook it forever, it never loses its shape. So it's not like a regular noodle where, you know, it'll get mushy if you overcook it or leave it in water. Um, and they sell these in Japanese grocery stores. Um, this one is made out of the whole brown shirataki and there's also a white one, which sometimes comes tied up in little bundles. Really, really strange noodle, but Japanese. Okay, next one. This is my knife that I was telling you about. What's beautiful about it, and it was only like 20 bucks, it just took forever to get from Japan, is that the pressure goes right down in the middle, the blade is absolutely straight, and you can get a much longer noodle, you know, from it. And if you ever see people doing soba noodles, like the real experts, they've got one of these that cost thousands of dollars and ten times faster than I did and just run through. But there, but this was a this is a good noodle um, from Buckwheat, and that's, I've kind of been using this as a cutter since then. Okay, next one. This one I made really recently. Um, I can remember what's in it now. It's a uh, pork, cured pork, and some kind of noodle. Um, I think they're pretty much the same noodles as these. And uh, I don't remember what stopped. Is there, is there more information on the thing? It's salad. Oh, sorry, yes, sorry, doy. Um, last week, started a new sourdough starter and wanted to see what it would taste like with, um, instead of using regular flours, have a sourdough, like wild sourdough starter. So they're really sour and, and nice. I think these, these came out fantastic. Super sour, in fact. 
Okay, um, this is another weird experiment, but let me let me uh, move this sauce now. So all I'm really going to do is put this into this. Turn the food mill. And all these little extraneous bits look squeezed through. This is a great machine. If anyone ever sees one, apparently this was in a garage sale. Someone picked up for five bucks here. It's a great, great tool. You can do like, you know, when you have a lot of berries, you can get the seeds out with this. Um, it works. You want to remove anything from the sauce. And at the end, you'll see it'll just be the skins and seeds. there. You can see the garlic has gotten crushed. It did all the work for me. I think that's probably good. Um, lower that way down. And I think the water looks like it's boiling. It is. Let's go in. that a stir. So the latest major upset in the world of noodles, people know who Harold McGee is, he's the scientist who uh, wrote on food and cooking. He said that you don't have to use a big pot of water to boil noodles. You can put them in a pan and just a little water and start it at cold water and boil it. And everyone said, no, it's impossible. It can't be done. You're crazy. Grandma would have, roll over in her grave. So I tried it. <laughs> it works fine. You don't need a big pot of water. It just seems like this is the right way to do it. I don't know. So these should take about two minutes two or three minutes. Um, I'm not gonna cook them all the way through. I want them al dente and then I'll put them back in there. And let's see what I've got next. So this is a sprout. This is barley, no actually it's wheat, that you'd buy for making wheatgrass. And I sprouted it to the point where it would be um, kind of where you'd make malt barley. So then you toast it and all the protein you get, it's far more nutritious this way, which is why people do it. And then I said, let's see what happens. The next one, please. Um, is it makes a really nice noodle. It has a lot sweeter flavor. The way it kind of tastes like beer, oddly enough. When you malt the stuff, it gets nutty flavor. And I'm almost tempted to add hops to this and just see what happens. I think it'll, it'll be, it should be good. Next one. This is a squash noodle. So squash, half squash, half flour. Those are those are standard little doodads that they throw in Japanese soup, which are which are nice. They're, they're sort of chewy fish cake thing. Um, next one is a squid ink pasta. You can just buy that squid ink stuff anywhere and uh, throw it into the little almost there. Okay, so someone give me a hand and just uh, drain these. Actually, I shouldn't drain them because I want some of that water. Do you have like a pair of tongs? Yes. I'll just put that up easier. Drain them. Drain them. Um, sometimes. The um, sauce will get a little thick, so you want to use some of the pasta water. So I'm just going to shove it in that way. Okay, next needle. Let's see what um, this is called um, uh, tonkatsu, which is basically a pork cutlet that's sliced and put into a bowl of noodles. I don't get it, honestly, because the pork cutlet gets all soggy, so I don't know why Japanese do this, but but I'd give it a shot and see what it's like. The next one is stock. So among all of this stuff, you know, if you use 
um, uh, store-bought stock. It's got a lot of junk in it, you know, just MSG. And so I've taken to making stock every Sunday, which is not a whole lot of work. And you get good at throwing things in. So this has got chicken and pork bones and vegetable scraps. I just save everything up from the week and make a pot about this size full of stock. And, you know, I usually get three or four quarts, which is fine for the whole week. And then I don't have to do it again the rest of the week, which is nice. Although some of the, some of the stocks are actually good. Um, this is a beautiful one. It's um, matcha tea. So, you know, you, uh, Japanese tea powder added to the noodle. And then it's cut on the chitara and add, put it into a tamarind broth. So the sweetness of the tea and the sourness of the tamarind, really, really, that's, a, that's one of my favorite soups there. Next one. Um, okay, so think about this. I want some guesses what this is made of. This was very recent. Well, what would you guess on top? It's clear. Bacon. Bacon? Okay, what goes with bacon? Eggs. So what could the noodles be made of? It's toast. <laughs> toast noodles. <laughs> totally sick, but I think it worked. So this is good. Um, yeah, yeah, I just... Toasted a piece of bread, ground it up, added a little more flour and egg, and then um, I think I extruded those. And it tastes just like toast. Yeah, and actually there's butter in it as well, so you get that flavor of buttered noodles. Um, this is my baby. This is a torquio um, bigola, which is basically a big crank that goes over a brass, uh, a bronze shaft. It's got a die in the bottom, and you turn this and it pushes the flour through. And what I found is that the noodles, most noodles actually stick together. Unless you use semolina flour, which is, you know, the way industrially it would be done, um, they stick together. So what I've taken to doing is, um, and you see I had to bolt it to my flour board and everything, but what I've taken to doing is putting the pot right underneath. So it just goes right into the pot and it boils and it's perfect. Um, these are tortellini, which are the really, really easy to make out of a, just as thin a delicate pasta as I could make, filled with, um, usually they put a combination of things in Italy. They, there'll be mortadella in there, veal, um, just um, eggs sometimes, all sorts of weird things. Those came out, those came out great. Um, oh, this is another really sick one. I love this, though. It's um, a tuna noodle casserole soup. <laughs> okay, so think of that really traditional, awful tuna noodle casserole, but it's got... Um, a tomato base instead of cream, and then it's got mushrooms and tuna and cheese, and it's, it's great. That's all I can say. Next one. Um, this is my first pulled noodle. Um, it's really hard to do. You can see I don't have the million strands, but have you ever seen people pull noodles and then slap it and turn it and everything? I haven't gotten the, the combination right. I, I think that they taste a little bit like soap when you use the, it's a potassium carbonate, um, potassium something, bis bisulfate or whatever. And I don't like the flavor of them, but at least I got uh, the technique down. And they, they were good. And that's those. And this is, this is done. Do you want to taste it?